Uh, Vice Chancellor, um, we'd like to ask you to address us, please. Hey, San Wonan. Dumela. Kiting. Things are falling. No, they are not important things that are falling. Oh, are they imp important? So, thank you very much for coming to this launch of a course in artificial intelligence. I would like to thank uh, Rory and your team, uh, Dr. Harris. I was very impressed by your education. I learned quite a lot of things from, from your talk and all the people who are involved in this talk. Uh, this morning I was teaching uh, in the Department of Political Science. I went to teach there, I was very Moved. I'm actually a good teacher, so. <laughs> so it was actually quite fantastic. So I'm excited about uh, the launch of this course. And the reason why I'm excited is that uh, I actually did a PhD in AI uh, from 1997 to 2000 at the University of Cambridge. Um, some of you probably were still uh, babies. Uh, Professor De Villiers, I am not speaking about you. <laughs> uh, you know who you are, who were babies at that time. So artificial intelligence is old. We tend to think that artificial intelligence is new. Most of the concepts of artificial intelligence were almost completely developed by the end of the 80s backpropagation, multi-layer perceptron, radial basis function, all the things that you know very well, I'm not even gonna name them, you know. They were all fully developed. And of course, you will be asking yourself, why are we only hearing about these issues now? When I was doing a PhD uh, more than 20 years ago, there was a list, I think it was published by Time Magazine. And then the list was top 10 hypes of the 80s that never saw the light of the day. And uh, number one was a concept called superconductivity. I don't know whether you know what superconductivity is. So in the 80s, uh, in fact, in the 70s, people won the Nobel Prize. Uh, Leon Cooper and his uh, uh, co-researchers uh, won a Nobel Prize, shared a Nobel Prize for something called superconductivity. So this is when the conductor of electricity is so efficient that there is no friction. So you are superconducting electricity, for example. And of course, the result of that is that uh, magnetic levitation becomes a possibility. So we thought we were going to build trains that will not experience friction. And it was a big deal. I mean, I remember uh, when I arrived in England in 1989, I was still in high school. Uh, as a delegate in the International Youth Science Fortnight in London. And everything was about superconductivity. So it was number one. Number two was artificial intelligence. In the 90s, we thought artificial intelligence had overpromised in the 90, in the 80s and underdelivered in the 90s. And there is a number of reasons why that is the case. Firstly, in the mid 90s, when I was getting out of uh, undergraduate uh, uh, studies in Cleveland, Ohio, in the United States, 
The computers were very, very slow. In fact, if you open a computer and you open a program, you couldn't open another program. So if you had opened Microsoft Word, okay, we used to call it Word Perfect. <laughs> uh, well, it was a different company, in fact, you know. Uh, uh, and you wanted to open Excel. No, 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 we never used to call it Excel. We used to call it Lotus 1, 2, 3. <laughs> You can see people nodding. They were there. So you had to close one window in order to open another. So the internet age would not have allowed that. It means that uh, you couldn't uh, you know, uh, navigate the web while you are doing something else. And then sometimes in 1995, a new computer called Pentium came into the picture. You still remember that Pentium? I still remember people even having their Pentiums in their houses and they will be making sh taking out dust so that uh, it can be shining. So the Pentium, you could be able to open two programs at the same time. And I still remember uh, a memory storage. It used to be called a, a floppy disk. <laughs> and the floppy disk used to have the memory of 1.4 megabytes. You still remember? 1.4 megabytes, you can't even have a picture, isn't it? <laughs> so you can imagine that this was a time in which Handling and storing data was a big problem. A very, very big problem. And that was about the same time I was doing a PhD. I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't take the data that I used for my PhD because I just did not have any storage to be able to have it. So because of the inability of computers to handle huge transactions or proce processing processes and the inability to store information. Artificial intelligence did not grow to be a powerful artificial intelligence and it is, that it has become. And everybody was very skeptical of it. So after finishing my, my postdoc, I went to brew beer at South African breweries. On Kromboot. Yeah, I actually can be able to brew beer. It's not difficult. All you need is, is water that has sugar. And yeast, the two together become alcohol. So that was what I was doing. So I arrived at uh, South African breweries I was recruited from London, and they said, you know, this, this thing that you have done, how can we use it? And at that point, they used to have a panel of beer tasters. So every morning, they will have uh, all the beer that has been brewed, and you will have 11 people who will come and drink. Each one of them will drink each of the, the beer and they will write a taste score. And in addition to that, they will go and do a chemical composition of beer. So I said, no, we can use neural networks to relate the measurements, the chemical components that have been measured to the taste score that those professional tasters would give. And if that artificial intelligence is able to do this well, then there is no need for beer tasters. You just have to go to the lab, do some form of uh, some chemical uh, experiments, uh, measurements, and you actually have your taste score. Of course, there is an advantage of a machine over a human being. Because a human being, when they have had arguments with their spouses the previous night, for whatever reason, 
their taste score becomes worse than <laughs> when they are happy. So it takes away human behavior from decision making. And human behavior in decision making, as Dr. Harris has indicated, is a problem. If you remove a human being from decision making, you get a more rational decision. A study that was done in Israel found that when judges actually sentence people just before lunch, they are much more harsher than <laughs> after lunch. You know, isn't it? No. So human behavior is a problem. It is a problem and it has to be removed. Uh, in part of the work that we have done, you can go and check it, we realized that uh, artificial intelligent machines make markets more efficient. And efficient mar markets allocate resources efficiently. And if resources are allocated efficiently, then your economy is much more robust than if resources are allocated inefficiently. Is that not a good thing? So artificial intelligence is here. Now, a year before his death, Michelangelo, who was an accomplished sculptor, painter, architect, and poet of the high renaissance, inscribed Ancora in Imparo on a sketch. Uh, Professor Tivilius, you know what I am saying. I know you speak Latin. In English, this means I am still learning. This is the premise of education and work of the fourth industrial revolution. Studies have shown that the four IR, based on technological changes such as artificial intelligence, and for the long time, we used to think artificial intelligence is um, a technology that allows machines to, mim to mimic human beings. But now we know that artificial intelligence plays better chess than a human being. So it is surpassing the capability of human beings. Now we know that artificial intelligence plays the Chinese Go game better than the best human being. So, AI is surpassing human capabilities and with de devastating consequences to us as human beings. A 2017 McKinsey report projected that by 2030, at least a third of the activities of 60% of occupations will be automated. We cannot, as the University of Johannesburg, remain static in the face of this paradigm shift, and we certainly cannot be complacent. I think I need to highlight this word, paradigm shift. You see, uh, the concept of paradigm shift was a word that was introduced by a philosopher, Thomas Kuhn. I took, when I was an undergraduate student, a course on history of science and technology, and his classic book was actually uh, prescribed. And he was talking about how society develops incrementally or through a paradigm shift sat down and invented that word. So artificial intelligence is a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift means you almost have to put aside almost everything that you knew, that you knew up to that point and replace it with the new paradigm. We know that when the physicist, the German physicist, Max Planck, 
made an assumption that uh, maybe energy occurs in packets, and he called these packets quanta. And uh, that was the birth of quantum mechanics, that the world was no longer the same. So this is what we call paradigm shift. So artificial intelligence is a paradigm shift that is happening right in front of our eyes. Yesterday, the United Arab Emirates announced that it will pilot the first university to have a singular focus on artificial intelligence. This is part of UAE's AI strategy, which focuses on developing a workforce vested, vested in rapidly advancing technology, which will undoubtedly transform economies worldwide. The Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence, a new graduate level AI research institution in Abu Dhabi, will accept applications for its first master's and PhD programs this month with classes scheduled to begin in September 2020. You don't have to apply to this university. University of Johannesburg even offers better AI than this university. The, uni the interim president of this university, Professor Michael Brady, puts it, and I quote, following decades of research into machine learning and AI, we are now at a turning point in the widespread application of advanced intelligence. The evolution is, among, among other things, creating exciting new career opportunities in nearly every sector of society." Close quote. I think I just need to highlight this issue of AI and machine learning. And many people, when they talk about AI, they always uh, include machine learning. So AI is a technology that uh, makes machines intelligent. It does not prescribe how you do that. And there are many ways in which you can be able to do that. The first way in which you can be able to do that is to look at advances in nature and try to emulate the mechanism in which they work. For example, an African poet, Eugene Marey, in his classic book, The Sylph and the Mill, identified that ants are actually very, very intelligent. And in fact, if you have interacted with ants, you will know that sometimes they form a straight line. That is the shortest distance from the nest to the food source. Now, that mechanism has been studied very, very well. That all they do when they are moving, they deposit something called pheromones. And because they are doing it at random, you know, uh, you know the, the path is almost randomly distributed. But because it is a randomly distributed uh, series of many paths, there is a a singular path with the strongest amount of pheromones where they end up at. And that is the shortest distance from their food source, to, from their nest to the food source. And that technology now is in the form of AI. This is what is used by electronic maps to find shortest distances between two points. So you take a mechanism in nature, and you program it so that your program is intelligent. You don't have to have lots of data if you understand the mechanism. So this is what is called computational intelligence. It's a type of AI. Then the second type is when you do not have too much data. Let us suppose you are in a, in a factory, and you have this man or this woman 
who actually just knows how to fix things. They can't explain it, but they just know how, you know, when things are broken, they can come and fix things, you know. So an AI system was developed so that you can transfer wisdom from people to machines directly. You don't have to have huge amounts of data to do that. You just have to come and observe people. And this is the type of AI called fuzzy logic. It falls under the type, general types called soft computing. Then you have the dominant AI, which is machine learning. This is the use of statistics and data to create machines that are intelligent. And if this AI machine learning is big and with many layers, this is what you call deep learning. So machine learning is just a sub-discipline of artificial intelligence. Now, going back to this university in the Middle East, this university has partnered with Abu Dhabi-based Inception Institute of Artificial Intelligence, an applied research lab to supervise PhD students and curriculum development. This comes after the country also appointed the world's first Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence, Minister Omar al Olama. We are on the precipice of change. As countries adapt to the elements of the fourth industrial revolution, the University of Johannesburg has to be a force of this shift. So this program that we have learned, we have um, uh, just started, is a short learning program eight, uh, aimed at all first year entering students and it is more than a tool to develop students' awareness of AI, its applications, and its implications for society and the future of work. And the implications are huge. The implications on ethics are huge. I am a member of a, a project by the World Health Organization where we are developing ethical guidelines for the application of AI in medicine. And some of these applications are almost at fruition. Just here at the University of Johannesburg, okay, it was a transition between VETS and, and UJ, we have developed an AI machine that is able to restore a lost voice Somebody has throat cancer and the voice box is removed, uh, but they can still move their tongue. So it looks at the movement of the tongue and create what a person is about to say. <laughs> this invention was featured in MIT Technology Review and there is even a US patent on this invention. So the implication of AI in decision making is huge. Whether it is in the military, whether it is in medicine, or whether it is in society. There are three modes of applying AI, let's say in the military. The first mode is called human on the loop. So a human being is there, they observe, and they will intervene if it is necessary. So this is almost like a, an autopilot. You know, pilots today, they are there. They are observing what is happening. But the AI system is actually the one that is doing the job. So the human being is on the loop. Then the second type, type is a human being in the loop, which means no decision is made until a human being 
actually says, okay, you can go ahead with the decision. So this is what is going to happen in medicine, where doctors are not going to be completely removed, but they will have machines that tell them what action to take, and based on the information, they will decide whether that action should go ahead or not. Then you have the most dangerous of them all. Is human out of the loop? <laughs> so you basically have a drone, and you go for lunch, or you go to the pub. And if that drone sees an enemy uh, approaching, it will decide whether to attack or not. <laughs> now, at the, at the uh, New York Stock Exchange, a few years back, you can go and read about this, there was something called a crash, a flash stock market crash. So basically what happened is, within a very short space of time, the Dow Jones just dropped and went up. And the reason for that was because of algorithms that were trading. They called them high frequency uh, trading. And because of stability issues, this thing actually just started trading in a way that was not desirable for the people who have invested in, in them. That was human being out of the loop. And now what is happening is that now they have a system almost similar to what, you, what we call circuit breakers. So if there is any overloading in your homes, what happens is that the system just shuts down. Isn't it, you know? Because if it does not shut down, the house probably will burn. So they, these are called circuit breakers. So the same thing has been applied to the stock market, that if the stock market starts behaving in a way that is not normal, then the system should just automatically shut down. So this is what is happening. So this course serves as a platform to st teach students where they fit in to the industrial changes that are accompanying the fourth industrial revolution. We have already seen the impact of the fourth industrial revolution. Now, the question that you might actually be asking yourself, this artificial intelligence must be complicated. And if it is complicated, why are we offering it to all the students? I don't think uh, artificial intelligence is complicated. I think it's actually a simple technology. Even though computer scientists and engineers make it complicated, when you read papers, it is full of lemmas and theorems. And when you actually interrogate what actually is happening, you realize that what is being done is so simple that you can actually explain it to a five-year-old and they will be able to understand. Now there is an AI algorithm called reinforcement learning. I was an undergraduate in the United States, and they, are, they expect engineers to take human and social sciences. So I took, and they, they have to be 12, and six of them must be in one area. So I took six economic classes. I did very well, in fact. Uh, and I took uh, three acting classes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> The reason why I am not in Mubango. <laughs> There's nothing to do with talent. I'm actually a good actor. I was even put on a play called My Children, My Africa. And I played the character Tamim Bikwana. I did, you know. And then I took two psychology classes. I couldn't stand those multiple choice examinations. <laughs> but in, in psychology, we are taught the theory of conditioning. I was taught. And the person who came up with this was a Russian psychologist called Pavlov. 
And Pavlov was experimenting with his dogs. So every day, just before dinner for them, he will ring a bell and then give them food. After a while, every time he rings the bell, the dogs started salivating. Of course, what happened there? He had conditioned the dogs to salivate every time there is a dog, there, there is food. And he uses reinforcement learning, punishment and reward is a principle of reinforcement learning. And that principle is what you call reinforcement learning in artificial intelligence. So one thing that is important in artificial intelligence is multidisciplinary educational experience. Because there's a lot of psychology, there's a lot of neuroscience in artificial intelligence, and there is a lot of algorithms, there's a lot of mathematics. Almost across the spectrum, it is there. Here at the University of Johannesburg, we have just launched a book, Artificial Intelligence and Learning for Children. You can go and buy it on Amazon. The Zulu, the Isi Zulu translation is on the way. The Sichuana translation is on the way. The Portuguese translation is coming out at the end of the month. And the vendor translation is also on the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it is when you translate the book, it is more than translation. Because now you have to translate concepts that do not exist in the language. What is reinforcement learning in Sisutu Salivua? What is the fourth industrial revolution in Isikosa? Well, I know what it is. It is Ingutu Yesine Yembeliso. So it is more than just translation. You are also translating a paradigm into a culture and a language. So this artificial intelligence is changing absolutely everything around us. In our book, Skynet in the Market, please go and buy it. I wrote it with Dr. Evan Hewitt. We talk about how artificial intelligence is changing the whole field of finance and economics. Here at the University of Johannesburg, we have a course on accounting and the fourth industrial revolution. It is the first in the country, by the way. So because of this, what do accountants do, Mrs. Kumalo? What do accountants do in this situation? How should we train them? It is pretty clear they have to understand what artificial intelligence is all about. And this is the course. This morning, in the Department of uh, Political Science, I was talking about a book that we wrote, Prediction of Interstate Conflict Using Artificial Intelligence. Can we be able to predict that two countries are going to go to war or not? How many of you think Lesotho and Sweden will ever go to war? <laughs> of course. Very few of us, because we can actually be able to predict. Now, we used to train political scientists so that they can be able to tell us countries' risks. Artificial intelligence does that much better than human beings. Very, very important, isn't it? You know? When I was learning about psychology many, many years ago, 1991 and 1992, to be exact, we learn about the behavior of people. Uh, that was the state of being. We need now to start learning new psychology. 
the behavior of people machine system. Because human beings can no longer exist without some form of a device. If we had told all of you to leave your phones outside, it will be chaos. <laughs> Isn't it, you know? It will actually be chaos because you have become a human machine system. And it has all sorts of psychological implications that we need to study and understand. A new discipline, machine psychology. Because machines, if they are doing the sort of things that human beings are doing, they obviously have their own psychology that we need to, to study it in isolation. Very, very important. The issues of language. Quite a number of years ago, me and my student, the late Mashaba Mashaba, I was at that university in Bramfontein. I'm not going to mention it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and at that time, we used to have uh, doctors from Cuba. They used to come and, uh, in our hospital. So we wanted to build a translator, a language translator, that will translate from our local languages to English. We started with Sisutu Saliwua. We created this system, it worked very well. You could speak to it in, in Sisutu Saliwua, and then it will translate into English, and vice versa. And then we wanted to extend this functionality to another language, Isikosa. And that was the beginning of our problems. <laughs> so every time a click happens, <laughs> it will automatically think it is noise and eliminate it. <laughs> and those of you who understand signal processing, you will understand why. So we spend a lot of time trying to figure out why, why, why. And then the explanation was actually linguistical. That Isikosa is actually not one language, it's two. In Africa, you have, according to Greenberg, you have five group of languages. And the most spoken language group of languages is called Bantu languages. It is spoken all the way to Tanzania. If you go to Tanzania and you speak Zulu, you will be able to get a, a, around because the words are similar. Akuna Matata in uh, Swahili is Akuna Matata in Isisutu, isn't it? And Akuna Matata in Veda. It's very similar, isn't it? You know? So Kosa is actually a Bantu language. Only when it does not click. <laughs> so in Venda, an uncle is Marume. In Isikosa, it's Malume. In Venda, if you say, come here, you say, Idahapa. In Isikosa, you say, Izapa. Doesn't that sound the same? Those are one, two words. In Venda, you say, Makazi for aunt. In Kosa, Mkazi. Makazi. You see? But same, isn't it? Yes. So it's a one, two language. But because the Vantus, when they came here, they encountered Khoisans, and the Khoisans, more than all other Vantus, actually encountered Khoisans, they adopted cliques. The four cliques, there are four types. Did you know that? There are four types that were actually uh, adopted. But the problem with Isi Khoisa is that it did not adopt too many cliques. Despite the stereotype, Kosa is only 5% clicks. 95% is not clicks. So in fact, when you listen to Kosa, when a machine listens to Kosa, it's one, two languages like this, then a click, then one, two languages, <laughs> then a click, you know? So it does not happen, because it is only 5%, it does not happen often enough so that a machine can be able to learn. And as a result, 
it's very, very difficult. Unless you do it one by one, if it is continuous speech, it's very difficult to actually hear the, 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 the clicks. But if it was Khoisan, which is a clicking language all the time, it has enough data points to learn. Now, the question that we have been asking ourselves is, how do we make sure that a, a language as in, important as Isikosa is not locked out of the fourth industrial revolution? How do we open doors for Isikosa? Now, the other example of what is happening, uh, he talked about some of this. If you go to Google Translate and you want to translate a Zulu expression, Akwetlanga, Lungetlanga, it interprets it as a nation of something. <laughs> you know? But it, it is a way of setting condolences. It does not know how to do this. In fact, Google Translate is able to translate from English to Isi Zulu better than it is able to translate from Isi Zulu to English. Why? Because the designer was an English speaker but not a, an Isi Zulu speaker. You see, in the Christian Bible, I can be a priest, you know. <laughs> in the Christian Bible, there is a, a a question that is posed uh, to Jesus Christ. And the question was, out of all the 10 commandments, which one is the most important one? And Jesus replies, as it is written. You know that, isn't it? You know? <laughs> love your neighbor as you love yourself. You see, he was quoting someone. Who was he quoting? Uh, Rory, do you know who he was quoting? <laughs> <laughs> he was quoting a, a Jewish rabbi called Hillel, who lived before him. In fact, Hillel is credited for having met a Gentile, and the Gentile asked, Tell me the whole of the Torah while I stand on one foot. And then uh, Hillel said, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Go and the rest is commentary. Go and learn. That was Hillel. This is called the golden rule. I read a book called uh, The Skin in the Game, written by Talib. And he has various ways of formulating this golden rule. He has the silver rule, he has the platinum rule. So he says the other one is, the other way to formulate this is to say, whatever you don't want another person to do to you, don't do it to them. Isn't it, Tina? So now coming back to artificial intelligence, it does not obey the principle of the golden rule. Because if it obeyed, then the translation from Isi Zulu to, 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 to English will just be as robust as the translation from uh, uh, English to Isi Zulu. So I think we should learn about artificial intelligence. We are not too old to learn. As I conclude, I am reminded of the actor Bruce Lee. It's not intellectual to be quoting Bruce Lee, is it? <laughs> I can see Dr. Harris is very uncomfortable. You know? <laughs> he says, why Bruce Lee, not Immanuel Kant? <laughs> so, the actor Bruce Lee in his book, Tao of Jeet Kune Do, which he wrote as a martial arts guide, he writes, and I quote, you must be shapeless, formless like water. When you pour water into a cup, it becomes the cup. 
When you pour water in, in a bottle, it becomes the bottle. What he really means, it takes the shape of the bottle. When you pour water into a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Water can drip and it can crash. Become like water, my friend. Be adaptable because the fourth industrial revolution is really about adaptability. Thank you very much, Niawonga. <laughs>